You know, this, uh, oh, I put this up here because, the, you know, one of the things about our ministry, the Brian Call, is that we have a website and it, uh, it's a collection. I mean, we have everything probably that we've ever done and it's all available for you, free. I mean, we have uh, things that you can download and uh, information that you can get, you know. That's one thing I've been, <clears throat> as you heard from the last message, I have the privilege of working with Dave and 35 years, but in the Berean call, um, 20 years. And, uh, you know, we've, I don't know what's been out there that we haven't covered or addressed. Uh, I mentioned 25 years ago we did the seduction of Christianity. That, uh, kind of interesting about that is that um, the uh, conservative, even when that book came out, the conservative evangelical church in America, uh, they were really thrilled uh, that we went after the, well, you know, what some of you call the wacky churches and, you know, prosperity teaching, uh, signs and wonders, false signs and wonders, and so on. They were thrilled that we addressed that until they got to chapter 13, which dealt with psychology in the church, and uh, that turned them off right away. Because the, that part of the church, the conservative church, was into it up to their eyebrows, and it's still going on today. So, um, but just to show you that the we are in the last days, and, and those issues that we dealt with, there seems to be something always new, always coming along, although it's the old lie. You know, and, and Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun, but, but you're going to get variations of it, and that's going to affect the church. The other thing about it is we being in the last days is that um, we're getting closer to, to a couple of things. You know, we, the rapture could, have, could happen any minute, uh, and I like to say, even before I finish this sentence, ah. <laughs> but, um, but the other side of it is the kingdom is being built. And it's not the kingdom of Christ. It's the kingdom of the Antichrist. If you look at eschatology, that's what follows. The rapture of the church, the saints, we saints are taken out, out of here. We, we're the bride of Christ. I'm going to address that um, in this message. And uh, then the the kingdom of the Antichrist takes over for seven years. As you know, it's the time of great tribulation. These are the times we're in. And if you're, um, if you're not seeing it, um, you need to open your eyes. You need to open your ears. But the problem is those of us who are seeing it, it's overwhelming, and it seems overwhelming at times. However, you know, where evil abounds, grace does more abound. God's grace is available. Also, it's a rescue operation. You know, we know what the Bible says, the technology, the way the things are going to develop in the last days before Jesus is returned. And uh, in that sense, if, if it's not going to turn around, well, what do we do, just throw the towel in and give up? No, we have a job. It's a rescue operation. We have to minister to people. For those, as you're going to hear in this, this, this uh, message, um, for, those, for those who have eyes to, hear, eyes to see and ears to hear, they need to take heed to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. You're going to hear that. Now, <clears throat> as I said, things are getting uh, tougher and tougher um, for those who are walking with the Lord, for those who are in ministry uh, like I'm in, the Brian Call. Um, one of the latest things I mentioned in our, the last session is a, uh, a book in the United States, The Harbinger. And this is to take, this has added new, a new dimension to false teaching and uh, people being attracted and drawn to, to, uh, uh, to things happening that are contrary to the Word of God. Now, this harbinger is written by a man named Jonathan Kahn, and he's a rabbi. Well, he's not really a rabbi. He's, a, he's Jewish. I guess that would make him a rabbi, but he's a pastor of the largest messianic church in the United States. And in writing this book, um, he's become an icon. Now, we not only have, and we've had, if you follow... Uh, you know, as I said, the wacky churches, there's new apostolic reformation, there are new, there's the latter rain, manifest sons of God movement, and so on, and all these bring about new apostles, new prophets, so-called, and so on. But now, we have a Jewish prophet, which in the eyes of many uh, has raised, oh, let's look here and look there. Now, I'm bringing it up because um, in 35 years of ministry, I've personally you know, never been subjected to the kinds of attacks personally um, because of something I wrote, I wrote or, or uh, addressed. 
I mean, the good, <laughs> the good news for me was I had many years to hide behind Dave. You know, hey, Dave, go ahead, you take it. You're out there in front. You know, I'm helping him, but I'm hiding behind him, in, in a sense. You, you know, I'm kind of tongue-in-cheek here, but, but Dave's not there anymore, and I'm taking some of this head-on. Now, look, I'm not bemoaning the fact. I, I'm a veteran in this, you know, if you could call it that, 35 years. But what grieves me about this is not the personal attacks and so on. You know, I, I, that's been happening to me for a long time. And that, honestly, personally, it doesn't bother me. What does bother me is the people that I see are involved in this now. Um, I, I'm totally grievous because good ministries, ministries that I've been, you know, even involved with to a certain point, are turning to this kind of thing. Now, I'm saying that because that's why the Lord put this message on my heart that, um, you know, the mentality has been, but more so than ever, is attack the messenger, shoot the messenger, and kind of blow off the message. Attack the messenger. I mean, we've seen that with, you know, I'm not putting myself in God's prophets thing, but we've seen that, you know, uh, Tanakh, the Old Testament, and uh, certainly Paul, you know, was chased about, and, and people went after him. And it may, mainly is a it gets to be a person. See, if you can't deal with the substance, if you can't deal with the content, then you go after, you go after the messenger. Now, having said that, um, I thought, and I believe the Lord put this on my heart, well, let's, let's bring a messenger to the fore here uh, and let's, let them go after him. And the messenger that I'm, that I'm dealing with here is Jesus. Jesus. So what you're going to hear in this message is how it's Jesus addressing the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, and he gets tough. Now maybe you haven't thought about this this way. There's all kinds of ideas about Jesus. But why does he get tough? And, and I'm going to deal with uh, the first, second, and third chapters of Revelation. And in this, so you can go there, but we may have some other verses to look at. But why would you do that? You know, I, I see lots of guys here. I, you know, you can't, you can't know how thrilled I am to, to be with you guys. And, and this next generation, I'm looking at it. and you guys, But you guys know that you're the bride. You're the bride of Christ. It may seem a little, wow, I mean, yes, you and everybody else here. We are the bride of Christ. And you're going to see how our Lord deals with the bride of Christ in a very tough way, for what reason? Because he knows what we're going to go through, what we're going to be faced, and he wants us prepared for it. And you'll see from the, from the verses of Scripture, that's, that's what he does. But, but let's get on with it. You see, but now I get a little anxious when, I, you know, when the Lord puts something on my heart. I know, you know it's of the Lord, but how, and, you know, I wonder if I'm handling it right or if I'm addressing it right. But you guys can help me. You know, this is like a... Uh, I'm laying it out for you, and if you have some issues with it and so on, you'd be a big help to me. Say, Tom, you know, I think you pushed this a little too far or whatever. Be a Berean. Be a Berean. Check, you know, search the scriptures to see if what I'm saying is true, and then help me out if, if I need to correct the course. You know, it's kind of like a, in a ship. When they build a ship, they take it out for a shakedown cruise, right, to make sure everything's working right and so on. So I'm, I'm using you guys to that end. So here we go. When you write something about Jesus, um, even our writing or, or, our writing or thinking about the biblical Jesus, problems can arise if we focus on one of his attributes at the expense and we lose sight of you know, his other attributes. That can give us a, stor a distorted view of Jesus. It's also possible to consider an attribute, one attribute of his, and that likewise can distort our true understanding of his character as revealed in Scripture. You see, all of his attributes are related, and of course, they're perfect. They're perfect in every way. Moreover, Jesus is, as we know, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's Hebrews 13.8. He doesn't change. So, again, what's with this title, Jesus Gets Tough? Well, as I said, the the title of the message has more to do with our reaction when we read something about him, um, acting or saying something in, in a way that may startle us. 
we're surprised because we may have not considered a certain characteristic of our Lord, although it's clearly presented in, in the Scriptures. For example, he's called the Lamb of God, and quite often we see him reflecting qualities, qualities of a lamb, meekness, and gentleness, and including the aspect of being the sacrificial Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. But in contrast to that, he's also the Lion of Judah. The Lion of Judah, Revelation 5.5. 5. Well, he appeared to Joshua with the sword in hand as captain of the host of the Lord. That's from Joshua 5.14. At his second coming, he's going to lead an army to rescue Israel from the nations that des desire to destroy it. And we won't find any characteristics that we think of as lamb-like involved in that scenario. Neither did he reflect the characteristics of a lamb when he overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple. Yet he is and forever will be the lamb of God and the lion of Judah and all that those titles imply. They are all indi an indication of his perfect qualities the perfect qualities of the biblical Jesus. Now, I'm emphasizing the adjective biblical because it's only through the scriptures through which Jesus has revealed himself that can, anyone can know him in truth. Remember, in the earlier session, we went over uh, extra biblical information, things that men make up, ideas that, that, that uh, people have. Well, all other perspectives are mostly what men think about him. Mormons have him as a family man, you know, being married to Mary Magdalene, Mary and Martha. Maybe uh, Carl will go over that. You know the PETA people? PETA, P-E-T-A, in America, it's called the people, people who, um, for the ethical treatment of animals. Well, they say he was a vegetarian. The gays promote him as gay, and so on. And we find all those people people groups refashioning our Jesus. But believers can also fall prey to a distortion of Jesus. Therefore, we need to question ourselves as to where we're getting our thoughts about him. Is our understanding from the word himself or from man's opinions and speculations and even scholarship, so-called? If it's the latter group, then it's a given that another Jesus Another Jesus will be fashioned in our mind. That's 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11, 4. He will be a counterfeit Jesus who can benefit no one. You know, a continual refrain from the leaders of the emerging church movement. I'm sure that's here because it's all over now. A movement that does what? They're trying to reinvent Christianity and to make it more accommodating to our culture, particularly young adults. Their deal is, well, we love Jesus, but we, we don't like his church. Well, you have to wonder what Jesus they're talking about. I mean, even a cursory reading of the Bible will show them that the church is the bride, temporal flaws in all, okay, for whom he's coming back to take her to heaven. Additionally, there are popular movements and trends and books that feature isolated characteristics of Jesus and doctrines of the word to the extent that they distort the biblical worldview, the biblical view. Maybe you're familiar with Rob Bell's latest bestseller, Love Wins. And then there's Brennan Manning, I don't know if you know him, but his book was very popular in the U.S. It was called The Ragamuffin Gospel. Well, what do they do? They take the doctrine of love far beyond the teaching of Scripture. The former to the her heresy of, if you've read Rob Bell's book. I mean, it's about universalism. Love wins. Everybody gets there. And the latter, Brendan Manning's book, implies that, oh, you know, God, in his love, he just winks. He just winks at sin. Yet again, we've walked with Jesus for, for many years, who love him and desire to please him. We, too, can fashion a distorted view of Jesus if we major on a particular attribute at the expense of others. So, understanding then that a biblically balanced view of Jesus is vital, we need to consider a characteristic of Jesus that seems to have been 
I don't know, maybe intentionally dismissed or at least purposely avoided in the church today. And obviously, you know, I'm, I'm from America, so that's my observation point there. In fact, in my more than three decades as a believer, I don't remember, with what I'm going over, I don't remember a sermon uh, preached on the subject of Jesus getting tough, getting tough with his church. To leave that characteristic out of our understanding of him will lead to problems in our walk with him. Well, the gospel certainly gives us information regarding his sternness with the Jewish religious leaders, right? But, I don't know, why? Because he confronted their hypocrisy. Also, the Lord offers a few rebukes to Peter and the other apostles who, whose inspired writings Become, became foundational to the developing church. Let's turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. See, in this epistle, as far as I can tell, and maybe you can help me out here, it's the first book that indicates a rather tough characteristic of Jesus for his own, who are in fact his bride. His bride. Verse 6, for whom the Lord loveth, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Hebrews 12.10, we're given specific reasons for the Lord's discipline of those whom he loves. Look at it. For our prophet... For our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Hmm. Nevertheless, it's not until the book of Revelation that we see Christ in a lengthy and very stern light in regards to his bride. John, the apostle, beloved of Jesus, is taken aback by the appearance of the one, I mean, you know, you know in, in the gospel, the one whose breast he had formerly rested his head upon. When Jesus dined with his disciples. That's John 21 20. But let's turn to Revelation 1. We're going to look at verses 12 through 16. That once former intimacy with Jesus that seems to, well, it just seems to have been lost in a startling vision. John's vision of his Savior. Look at this. And I turned to see a voice that spake with me. This is, this is John, the beloved, speaking. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps and with a golden girdle. And his head and his hairs were like white, were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet were like fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Revelation one seventeen. But before we, as you, if you're looking ahead to it, you see, we can't know what was going through John's mind seeing such an imposing image of his Savior. But we do know his reaction. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Now, Jesus could appear to his beloved disciple as, you know, when John last saw him after the resurrection. But he chose to send him and us a very different message. I certainly don't understand all the symbolism involved, but, but you know, one doesn't need to, in, need to in order to come away with a very sobering impression. His hair, his eyes, and his feet all seem to represent purity. Purity and the process of purification. Well, the instrument Jesus cho chose for his purifying process is a sharp, Two -edged, a sharp two-edged sword, which comes out of his mouth. And 
Right? That can only represent the sword of the Spirit, His Word. Ephesians 6.17, which we learn in Hebrews 4.12 is what? Living and powerful and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is nothing timid about the symbol Jesus selected to represent His Word. You know, a sword is not only a weapon of war, it's also used for clearing one's path for cutting away that which will entangle and choke, choke out life. Moreover, a surgeon's sword, that is the scalpel, can pierce one's joints and marrow to excise tumorous cancers. Psalm 119.9. See, that's how sin is in one's life and how it must be dealt with. The psalmist wrote, Wherewithal shall a young man, young woman, Cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. John 17, 17. And Jesus prayed to the Father that those who follow him be set apart from the world by, by what? By scripture. Sanctify them. means set apart. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That was our Lord's prayer for his disciples who walked with him then and it's the same for those who follow him today. We are his disciples if we're walking with him. Well, the first three chapters of Revelation are quite unique in Scripture. In, in them we're going to see Jesus. Well, he directly addresses and encourages, yet mostly corrects the church. To say he gets tough with his bride would hardly be an abuse of the, of the text. The churches that he was speaking to existed at the time that John wrote Revelation and were located in the Roman province of Asia, which is now modern-day Turkey. Six of the churches were within 100 miles of each other. Laodicea, the furthest south, was about 200 miles from the northernmost church of Pergamos. None of those churches exist today, although the problems Jesus raised can be seen throughout church history. William MacDonald, who was one of our board members and wrote um, many great books, really good. Uh, but he, it's the only commentary that we offer is the Believer's Bible commentary. And here, here's what he writes in that. Ephesus, from the 1st to the 4th century, the church suffered persecution under, Ro under the Roman emperors. Smyrna, during the, uh, from the 1st to the 4th century, the church suffered persecution under the Roman emperors. Pergamos. During the 4th and 5th centuries, Christianity was recognized as an official religion through Constantine's patronage. Thyatira. From the 6th to the 15th century, the Roman Catholic Church largely held sway in Western Christendom until rocked by the Reformation. In the East, the Orthodox Church ruled. Sardis. The 16th and 17th centuries were the post-Reformation post period. The light of the Reformation soon became dim. Philadelphia. During the 18th and 19th centuries, there were mighty revivals. Mighty revivals and great missionary movements. Laodicea. The church of the last days is pictured as lukewarm and apostate. It is the church of liberalism and ecumenism. Well, such general observations ring true to history, but are not exclusive. One can see various aspects of the things Christ addressed in the seven churches in local churches throughout the world. In other words, the churches of Revelation are alive and not so well, five of them at least, wherever believers dwell together today. Ephesus, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Laodicea feature issues that Jesus wants corrected. Certainly then, but definitely now in, in our own churches. As the text clearly shows, these are not simply suggestions on his part. Revelation 2.4. The church at Ephesus had many standout qualities, good works, perseverance, critical discernment regarding doctrine and leadership. Even so, Jesus takes the fellowship to task regarding a very critical issue. Look at verse 4. 
Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Well, we're not told exactly how the believers came to lose their first love, but we can get an idea from Scripture. Their good works, which should have been a byproduct that grew out of their love for Jesus, very likely took precedent over the relationship the Ephesian believers had with him. The Apostle Paul's admonition to the Galatians seems applicable here. What is it? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, you are now made perfect by the flesh? Galatians 3.3 3. A believer's love of the Lord must be central to whatever he does. When that begins to slip, what follows is the automatic slide into efforts generated and accommodated by the flesh. To the degree that the flesh has its way, to that degree, God's grace is displaced. Our works need to be not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. That's Zechariah 4.6. There's little doubt that the church in our day would be even more prone than the Ephesians to displacing its love for the Lord, given that it has been so, so inundated, influenced by self-teachings that have entered the church. Teachings like self-esteem, self-love, self-worth, self-image, self-confidence, and on and on, self ad nauseum. Furthermore, a preoccupation with self makes it difficult to recognize and receive stern correction. Oh no, this, this couldn't be Jesus talking here because you know, he's lowering my self-esteem. He's maybe making me feel bad about myself. Well, that's the mentality of many. Furthermore, a preoccupation with self makes it difficult not only to recognize these things, but to repent of them. The common refrain, refrain is, as I said, that can't be referring to me because most of us have been conditioned to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Romans 12.3. Moreover, many Christians are of the opinion that Jesus surely wouldn't say or do anything to, as I said, lower, lower somebody's self-image. That's the Jesus of psychobabble and so-called Christian psychology who is a false Christ fashioned by man's flesh. This is the Jesus whom the world loves and who is all about accommodating mankind, and who certainly doesn't square, this Jesus does not square with his word. This is not the word. He's especially foreign to the chapters of Revelation that we're going to be considering, that is, this worldly Jesus. Well, Revelation 2.5. See, the consequence for the Ephesians who are drifting away from their first love, and who fail to repent of their abandoning their focus upon the Lord would be the removal, removal of what? Their candlestick. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. You know, there's no deep secret in the symbolism of the candlestick. It represents, quite simply, the light of Christ. and Those, well, who is what? The light of the world. That is the word. The only way for one's love of Christ to increase is for believers to grow in their personal relationship with him by the continual reading and living out what, God, what the word of God says. That's what I stressed in the earlier message. Without that discipline, the love of Christ is a who is what? A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path will inevitably wax cold. And as that light dims, it follows that a believer will have no basis for biblical discernment and therefore will cease to produce any spiritual fruit. That's why what you're going to hear, Jesus is laying out for us, for the bride. Notice that Jesus said, I will. I will come quickly and will remove thy candlestick. One of the points I want to emphasize here is the fact that, again, it is Jesus himself who is correcting. Remember what I said earlier? You know, all right, shoot the messenger. What? No. You, I mean, we fallible uh, people that are used of the Lord to present things that we're concerned about and so on. There's nothing fallible about this messenger. Correcting his church. He is the one getting here. 
you know, there's been a tendency throughout history, church history, and continues today to, to deal with those who would bring biblical correction, as I said, by shooting the messenger. Well, in putting together this message for the conference, I said this earlier, as it happens to all the messages that I believe the Lord has put on my heart to preach, the conviction I'm presenting begins with me. I told you earlier, <laughs> I don't preach it, you guys. The Lord puts a message on my heart. This is where it starts, and I have to deal with it, as we all have to deal with what the Lord is speaking to us. We, the bride, need to come to grips with the characteristic of Jesus, the bridegroom. He is the bridegroom that we may not have been aware of because it is imperative that we all know him and love him as he is in truth. Well, this, these, three, these three chapters uh, given to John, John the Beloved, present a Jesus in a symbolic way, yes, a way far different than when Jesus was physically with John during the years they walked together. John the Beloved, who seemed to have had a more intimate relationship with him, as we saw, sees an image, is confronted by an image so overpowering that, as we saw, can only drop to his face before him. You know, there's little doubt that John's relationship with Jesus, after Jesus ascended into heaven, nevertheless, it's, there's little doubt that his relationship with Jesus grew deeper with him. And it, as it should with what? With all believers who mature in the faith. But again, it's, it seems that John was not prepared. Not prepared for what he witnessed. Why? I think because, as the image implies, our Lord wants his followers to be pure, to be holy, just as he is pure and holy. First Peter 1, 15 and 16. But here's Revelation, verses 14 and 15. We need to take a look at this and take heed. Well, you, you'll hear that. See, that seems to be indicated in his hair and the fiery image in his eyes. His head and his hairs were like white wool, white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. Verse 16. See, all of those symbolic elements, as I said, not only do they represent purity and purification, they represent judgment. That seems to be underscored by the two-edged sword protruding from the mouth of the image of Christ in verse 16. The sword, as we noted, it is his word, the scriptures, by which everyone will be judged. You see, there is judgment. You know, we, there's the judgment seat of Christ where we stand before him for rewards. But then there's the great white throne judgment. All those who don't come to Christ, they're going to have to deal with that judgment. But if we think there's no judgment for us, it is not for salvation. There's nothing we can do for that. Get that point. Important if you don't understand that. Christ paid the full penalty for our sins, past, present, and future. But where is bride? He wants us to walk in the white raiment that he has for us. Well, we'll see that. His words... Again, we'll judge believers in the sense of correcting and pruning so that their lives might conform to the truth and be increasingly fruitful. Revelation is not directed at the world. That is these first, <laughs> I'm talking about the first three chapters. After that, that's what it's about. But this part is directed at his bride, his church. Verse 5, these are the ones whom John declares the groom loves. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. You know, the Revelation is going to talk about overcomers. That's how we overcame. If you're a believer here and you know Christ, you've been washed from our, your sins in his blood. Yet any believer who doesn't grasp that Jesus is getting tough as I said earlier, getting tough with the bride is missing a very important aspect of his message to the seven churches. He wants her to shape up before the wedding. Well, to me, it seems like a... <laughs> I have a, my youngest daughter is getting married in, uh, in November, so maybe I have these ideas on my heart, <laughs> close to my heart. But it seems to be a prenuptial exhortation. 
But why would Jesus speak to his bride the way he does? You know, it certainly isn't the way young men today go about wooing their brides in order to ensure that they show up at the church, as you'll see. Of course, what seems right to us because of our worldly or cultural influences, that rarely conforms to the teachings of Scripture. Nevertheless, the question remains, why would Jesus read his bride the riot act, as he seems to be doing in his messages to the seven churches? Now, I want to suggest some possibilities. First of all, and foremost, it is for her good. He seems to be doing, giving his message. I mean, you know, this is, that's pre pretty much a safe conjecture because everything Jesus says and does is good. And for the good of those he addresses. Yet there is much more that we can surmise. Although we're ex we are to expect the Lord to return for his, for his bride to take her to heaven at any time, we can't know the day or the hour, but we do know the spiritual condition, the spiritual condition of the world at that time. Luke 18.8 and Matthew 24, we're going to look at some of those. It's indicated in his words, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, I believe this is the rapture, shall he find faith on the earth. In the Gospel of Matthew, our Lord tells his disciples that the days prior to his return will be characterized by spiritual deception. Take heed that no man deceive you. The deceit will be terribly seductive. For there shall arise, I'm quoting, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. Inasmuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And that's Matthew 24, 24. But you know, some claim, however, that this verse teaches that the elect are immune to such deceptions. That view has many problems. Remember in our last session what I said? Sometimes we've just got to take time out and think. Think through these things. Yeah, we want to think biblically, but sometimes just thinking about what's being presented, we, that's where we need to go. Jesus was speaking to his disciples. Remember? Take heed that no man deceive you. And he's speaking to his disciples. Wouldn't you call them the elect? Well, why would he say that if they couldn't be deceived? Make sense to you? Believers have always been subject to deception. Scripture warns them against falling for Satan's devices. 2 Corinthians 2.11 Furthermore, all of the epistles, which are written to believers, contain corrections of false doctrines that either have seduced or had that potential. Such are the things that the Lord knows that his bride, us, will face. Christ's sternness, in one way, may be compared to a drill sergeant who prepares his raw recruits for warfare. You know, a drill sergeant's reputation, I'm sure it's here as well as in the U.S., well, no matter what the army, is u universally known for being hard on his men. His approach is no nonsense because he has a concern not only for their safety, his troop survival, but that his soldiers will be victorious in the battles they will face. Similarly, believers in Jesus down through the ages have been subjected to intense spiritual battles. Our Lord's concern is for how they will fare, how we will fare, with regard to what we will face. Therefore, he points out issues to the seven churches and to us today that will seriously undermine their relationship with him and consequently their effectiveness for his kingdom. You know, the Ephesians, for example, as I stated earlier, well, they were commended for many things, but their foundation was being undermined as their active love for the Lord was fading. That may seem insignificant compared to all the good works that they were doing. Yet, it is more critical than maybe we realize. And simply so. You know, it's what I love about the Word of God. Guys, I'm just a C-plus student. You know, Dave Hunt, I mean, just hanging around, Dave, for, for the privilege that I had. You know, w w you guys say brilliant, but, but when we say brilliant, we're talking about intellectually in every, every which way. But that's not me. I'm just a simple-minded guy. See, if the love of Christ is not our first and foremost motivation for the works that we do, then what will be our motivation, even though we may not be aware of it? Self. 
And where the leaven of self enters in, the loaf of pride rises, which is a primary recipe for the works of the flesh. Go back to 2.5. The issue is so serious that the Lord declares to his bride, the Ephesians, and again to us, that if they do not repent, he, he will remove their candlestick out of its place. Now let's take a closer look at this candlestick symbol. A candlestick is a life, a light-giving instrument, a symbol that giveth light unto all that are in the house. And in, pa that's, and in passages Matthew 5, 14 and 15, Jesus calls his disciples the light of the world. We have so many of these. They were only that light in the sense that what they taught others to observe, Jesus said, observe all things that I've taught them, that Jesus taught them, Matthew 28, 20. His word, it's all about the word, the word, the word. Peter refers to the scriptures which he calls the word of prophecy as a light that shineth in a dark place. I believe the action of the candlestick, again, it's also referred to as a lampstand, being removed is primarily a drifting away from the light of God's word as believers' love for him waxes cold. Furthermore, in John 8, 12, Jesus, who is the living word, referred to himself as the light of the world. Isaiah, as well, shows clearly the relationship of light and the scriptures. If they speak not according to God's word, it is because there is no light in them. Well, from this point on, we're, we're going to be considering almost exclusively chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Re Revelation. So if you're not there with your Bibles, you need to get there. As we noted earlier, the seven churches of Revelation were not only specific churches functioning at the time when John wrote the book, they are also reflective of what the church in general experienced at certain times throughout history. Moreover, the issues that Christ addresses can be found, in, as I said earlier, in local churches throughout the world today. So, as we are repeatedly urged, we need to heed what Jesus said to the historic churches and apply them to our local churches and to ourselves as individual believers. His bride, today. To two of the seven churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, well, Jesus offers no correction, only comfort and encouragement through, the, through what they have suffered and will suffer for their steadfastness in the faith. Well, there are multitudes of fellowships undergoing similar persecution for their witness for Christ today and many that perhaps will be subject to the same in the future. Christ's words, therefore, as they are heeded, will strengthen and give heart to his bride to not only endure, endure what's ahead, but be victorious and fruitful through it. The groom's address to, address to the, um, well, the other five churches consists mainly of a list of issues that will create major spiritual problems for his bride. Problems that will critically affect believers' relationship with him and their fruitfulness for his kingdom. To underscore what is central to correcting the churches that have drifted away from his word, our Lord repeats the symbol for the word. He first identified himself with addressing the church at Pergamos, and he says, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. This is not only central, but again, it's the only basis for the necessary critical discernment the bride, the bride must have in order to recognize deception or perhaps repent of an erroneous spiritual practices she may have gotten into or may face. The church at Pergamos had problems were hardly, well, which was hardly unique to that fellowship. It had some within that fellowship who were teaching false doctrine, likely for material gain or fostering sexual immorality. The church had some who held the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, no doubt some form of elevating the leaders to a higher spiritual level and control over the laity. That's what many think. Nicolaitans means control over the laity, that is, over their brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Well, that's apparent today in churches where there's a hierarchy and a distinct clergy class. And Jesus declares he hates that. And he will deal with it directly through his word if the fellowship does not repent. Revelation 2.18. Here Christ speaks to the church at Thyatira in terms that clearly indicate judgment. Reiterating the earlier symbols of revelation that represent judgment. These things saith the Son of God who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. The church has a woman, a false prophetess, who has introduced sexual immorality, spiritual fornication, and practices related to idolatry, whom in his mercy and long-suffering he's given her time to repent. You know, uh, this is why I grieve for you young people. Morality has gone by the boards, even among Christians. I mean, Christians, uh, you know, marriage in the United States is less than 50% people living together, believers living together, babies out of wedlock. More than, more, there are more babies born out of wedlock than are born to married people in, in the United States. When you're in that and you're, you, you know, you have to deal with it, this is what the Lord is saying. Well, Revelation 22, 23. You see, in his concern for this fellowship of believers, he has his most sobering and sternest words. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he that searches the reins and hearts, and I will give every one of you according to your works. You know, if the words here seem shocking to some of us, it may be because we've been so mesmerized by our politically, socially, religiously, and psychologically correct thinking that we've been blinded, that we've been blinded to the strong deterrence. I mean, think back. If you've been to the Scripture, what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? When our Lord started the church, you know, he does that. <laughs> but by his mercy, you know, it's not that he lets the standards s slip, but his mercy moves on. Well, he's talking to his bride here. He doesn't want us to be impacted, affected by these things. Furthermore, you know, we may have lost sight of the fact that he is speaking as the one who loves those that he's addressing and has washed them from their sins in his own blood. We can't lose sight of that. You see, some of it's difficult because we read things, and especially when the world gets on, well, what about this? And what about that? Well, the natural man does not understand the deep things of God. But sometimes we as believers who know him slip into that thing. But if you know and love Jesus, you know everything that he does is good, even though we, we, we may not be able to get a handle on it or get our head around it. To the church at Sardis, which is only a remnant of steadfast believers, he exhorts to be watchful and strengthen the things which remain and to remember what they have received and heard and hold fast and repent. If they will not watch, our Lord declares that he will come, as a, come upon thee as a thief and thou shalt know what hour, shall not know what hour I come upon thee. 1 Peter 4.17 I believe this is a visit, what we just addressed, is a visit for corrective judgment of his church, his bride. This is what Peter prophetically confirms. For the time has come that judgment must begin in the house of God. He's talking about the church, his bride. You see, the groom has gentler words for the bride at Philadelphia. A fellowship of little strength, little strength, yet they have kept Christ's word and has not denied his name. He declares his love for them and praises them for living out his word in patient perseverance. Nevertheless, they're warned to hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Now think about this. Here we have the groom speaking to the bride. A bride arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Why? Well, because of his imputed righteousness, not of our own selves, 
but he wants her to be adorned with crowns earned by her loving obedience to his word. Many have suggested that the church of Laodiceans is the church most representative of the churches of our day, particularly churches in the West. One definition I found for the word Laodicea is interesting. Rule of the people. Another was judgment of the people. It doesn't say rule of Christ. Judgment of Christ. Revelation 3.17. Both of these definitions seem to be appropriate to Christ's admonitions and, and what they're doing. Doing their own thing. And he is outside their fellowship. They seem to be so self-absorbed their materialistic self-sufficiency that they cannot recognize that they are spiritually wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. How does the bridegroom address this condition? Verses 15 and 16. I believe in the strongest language yet regarding those whom he characterized as lukewarm and neither hot nor cold. He declares... I will spew thee out of my mouth. Here again we ask, why would the Lord speak to his bride in such a way? Why? Here in these last passages of Revelation chapter 3, he spells out reasons quite clearly regarding what I referred to as his, I mentioned earlier, his prenuptial exhortation to the seven churches. Revelation 19. Verse 319, he declares, As many as I love, remember, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. But in verse 318, here, well, he loves the bride, and he counsels her to receive from him things that have been purified and will purify her life and love for him. Spiritual gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye that thou mayest see. He concludes his exhortation to his bride, to us who profess to believe in him, who claim to follow him, with an offer that implies a reality check, a check of our relationship with him, as the one to whom we are betrothed. Has our love for him become lukewarm? Or have we drifted away from our first love for him as he indicted the Ephesians? Revelation 3.20 Whatever our condition may be, he urges and encourages us, be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Well, the bridegroom is willing, isn't he? He's not only willing, he is urging. But what about the bride? Whatever instruction we find in the word of God, wherever it is, we need to take heed. Yet there's something really interesting about scripture. You know, when something's repeated, such as Jesus saying, verily, you, you take heed, right? When he says, verily, verily, you really take heed, or you should. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this before. I know I didn't until, as I said, the Lord put this on my heart. How emphatic might this be when the instructions to his bride are repeated seven times? His bride? How critical might these words of his that we've gone over, how should we regard them, heed them, when our Lord repeats again them seven times? Here are the words. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That's us. Well, where are they? Revelation 2.7, Revelation 2.11, Revelation 2.17, Revelation 2.29, Revelation 3.6, Revelation 3.13, Revelation 3.22. Wow. Wow. I believe it is imperative, therefore, especially given the times that we're in, that we take heed to our Lord's words. You know, this isn't just by chance. I mean, seven times, we know that is a perfect number. But for the Lord to repeat them over and over again, 
You know, talk about a wake-up call. Talk about trying to get our attention. Because he wants us at the wedding to be, you know, not just because of what he's done, but because of, you know, rewards, because of how we're, we, we have decorated. And, you know, and again, it's by grace. What do we do with crowns? You know, so it's not some ego thing. We ca cast them at his feet, don't we? But that's how the bride is going to be dressed. That's what he wants. Well, the only way I believe that we can do this, and it's really simple, everything is very simple. Difficult sometimes, demands discipline. Get into the Word, get into the Word, get into the Word, get to know Him better. Obey what He says, do what He says, not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And this life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's all there for us. Well, let's end it with this. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And that let him that is a thirst. Are you thirsty for the Lord? Like David was. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, whosoever will. You know, I love this because all you need to bring to these things that we're talking about is a willingness to do His will. The Lord, again, by His Spirit, will enable. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Let's pray. Lord, tough words for us, tough words for me, I can tell you that. Wow, and hopefully for all of us, but good words. Good words, Lord. But Lord, again, you know, we, we can't do any of this on our own. You know, the Ephesians tried it, and they drifted away from, from your love. Lord, help us to that end. Help us to grow in our love for you, in our obedience to the things that you say. You say, if you love me. You know, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do, don't do what I say? But Lord, you say, if you love me, do the things that you say, Lord. And that's my heart for, for myself and for everyone. And I thank you, Lord, that if we have a heart that's willing, you will enable us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.